Online Church, Pastor Ed Newton coming to you from San Antonio, Texas at our main campus. And wherever you're watching and listening from, know that we are honored and blessed by you being linked up and in the loop of what God is doing a part of this faith family called Community Bible Church. We have a message today entitled Counting Sheep. It's in our I Am series. And as we talk about Jesus being the good shepherd, what a reality that not only he leads us, but he guides us. And he does it specifically and personally in a relationship with us. And I know that God's going to speak to your heart today. He's already spoken to mine. And I cannot wait to hear from you personally how God has spoken to you. So you can email us at nextsteps@communitybible.com, at or you can visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. As always, thank you so much for being a part of the journey, for your prayers, for your encouragement, and also your sacrificial giving as we seek to make much of the resurrected Savior. And our hope and prayer is that the resurrected Savior would be constantly resurrecting you to a greater awakened life, to the fullness of what He's called you to. Until we meet again, much love. Now, you don't need to be reminded that Easter is next weekend, but just for clarification, one o'clock service, every single weekend is Easter at Community Bible Church. Amen? Every single weekend, we celebrate a resurrected Savior and our soon and coming King. Well, one of the things that you need to know is that we've created space. It's a highlight for us here at Community Bible Church. We literally double in attendance, which is crazy. Like, I've never been a part of anything like this in my entire life. It's one of those moments where we literally could have 24, 25, 26,000 people on this campus. And so we've just created space. That is Friday, 7 o'clock. Saturday, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Sunday, 9, 11, and 1, all in this room. And I'm just asking you, 1 o'clock crowd, As you always do, I need you to come strong and not come alone. That is the number one reason why people don't come to church is because they're not invited. And one of the things I love about our church is the willingness that you have to put yourself out there and invite people to come with you, much as you've done today. And if you're visiting with us for the very first time, it is an honor to have you in our house. We have a free gift for you. If you'll stop by the guest relations counter, we try to bribe you with just a little item that just says Community Bible Church on it. But may it be a reminder that you're not a face in a crowd here. Your family here. And that's our prayer. Is that you would feel the love of this family that seeks to walk alongside of you. And every single one of you count. You matter. And I know that God's got a purpose and a specific message for us today. So if you got a Bible, John chapter 10 is our focus passage today, John chapter 10. Now as you're turning there, we have been talking about Jesus being the I am, not the I was, but the I am. And Jesus in John chapter 6 is the bread of life, connecting back to the Old Testament miracle of the feeding of God to the nation of Israel. In John chapter 8, Jesus is the light of the world as he stood on the temple mount during the Feast of Tabernacles, a Jewish holiday, signifying that God would lead the nation of Israel by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Jesus would stand by a menorah, which is a candle abra. And as it was unlit on the eighth day, signifying the anticipation and the awaiting of the Messiah, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Last weekend, we talked about Jesus being the door, and today we talk about Jesus being the good shepherd. The door statement and the good shepherd statement are in unison together. Now, if you got something to write with and a listener guide in your hand, come on, shake those listener guides at me so I can see you, all right? Fan your neighbor for just a second. I love that. There's some announcements in there, but also there's some fill in the blanks. But I want to give you fill in the blank. Number one, after I read John chapter 10, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them and he flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Then verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own. 
and my own know me. Point number one, write this down as I write this on the door. Point number one, I want you to see the contrast between shepherds. The contrast between shepherds. Jesus uses a word. Come on, one o'clock service, y'all with me? He uses a word. It is the word kalos. Now, there are two Greek words I put in your notes. I'm not trying to impress you with Greek. I just am trying to teach you something that the word good oftentimes might have a greater meaning. That's why we got to go back to the original language. Simple language, Greek language, difficult to understand. I never mastered it, but because of tools such as the Internet and even some software programs, I'm able to look this word up and go, does the word good mean like just good? And it doesn't. It's another step beyond just good. It's the word kalos, the value, the truth, the beauty in character and in service. That word kalos is what he uses. Why would Jesus use that word versus the more common word, which would be agathos, which would just be moral excellence or moral quality? Why would he use a different word? Here's the reason why. Now hang with me. In John chapter 9, John chapter 10, Jesus heals a man that was born blind. And then he steps back, and then the religious leaders have a conversation with this man who's been transformed by Jesus. The religious leaders ask the question, who did this to you? And this man whose life had been changed says, Jesus. At that moment, the religious leaders of the day show a man whose life has been changed the door. They excommunicate him from the temple no longer invited to be a part of that religious experience. Which means when Jesus finds him, he says to him, I am the door. The door of religion does not get you to heaven. The door of religion does not get you forgiveness. I am the door. And he would use it in the same context of the sheep and the sheep pen that would have no door, and Jesus would say, I'm the door, which means he would lay, the shepherd would lay down between the two walls, signifying security for his sheep, protecting what's on the inside from what's on the outside, and from the outside getting in on the inside, which means when Jesus says he's the door, he's also saying he's the good shepherd. Now watch this statement found in Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why does the Bible say still waters? Do you know that sheep will never drink from a water source that's moving? Sheep are top heavy, small legs. Which means if the water current sweeps their legs from underneath them, they could potentially drown. Which means the shepherd leads them beside still waters. Not only that, but he restoreth my soul. Verse 3 of Psalm 23 says this. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. What is the word that's used about our shepherd? He leads versus drives. That's why I put that in the notes for you. Because you need to know the difference between western shepherding and eastern shepherding. Eastern shepherding, the shepherd walks in front of the sheep. Western shepherding, the sheep ultimately are driven by the shepherd from behind. Did you catch that? But in Psalm 23, verses 2 and 3, he leads me. He walks in front of me. It was in Israel several years ago that a rabbi was having a teachable moment on John chapter 10, speaking about the sheep knowing the shepherd's voice. All of a sudden, it was a living, breathing, real illustration of a flock of sheep and a shepherd. But the audience raised their hand and said, Rabbi, you just told us that the shepherd walks in front of the sheep, but that shepherd is walking from behind, driving the sheep. Which one is it really? And all of a sudden, the rabbi said this, that is not the shepherd. That is the butcher driving them to the slaughter. Now, one o'clock service, listen to me. When Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, he's making a contrast as to say, if I'm the good shepherd, then there's what? Then there's bad shepherds. And bad shepherds are driving people. And this is what religion does. Religion drives you, do better, 
try harder, somehow, some way, check off the right boxes, jump through the right hoops, and that's religion. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiving, go, for, forgiving people go to heaven because we have a Savior that doesn't just drive us. We have a Savior that leads us. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he's trying to drive us because many of us have been completely exhausted by religion. And we just go, I'm, I'm done. I'm tapping out. Like, it's over. But you got to realize that our good shepherd, the reason why he's good, he leads versus drives. Does that make sense? Come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate that. He leads us, guides us. But not only does the Scripture teach us about the contrast with that word good, but also I want you to notice not only the contrast, but the conviction of the shepherd. Conviction. Now, as you write that down, you'll see this in verse 11. It is the Bible teaches that Jesus, as the good shepherd, lays down his life for the sheep. The word for is spelled in the Greek language H-U-P-E-R. Put it in your notes. That phonetically is sounded hooper, as to say, I play basketball and I'm a hooper. That's how that sounds. Now, the word hooper literally means to die in place of. Now, I want to teach you something. I didn't grow up in church, but when I understood this, this was game changer for me. In the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of sheep dying for the shepherd. But in the New Testament, because Jesus is the good shepherd, what makes him good? He would teach us this, that the shepherd dies for the sheep. Did you catch that? Old Testament, sheep die for the shepherd. New Testament, the shepherd dies for the sheep. Therefore, through this analogy that took place in Scotland about an orphaned ewe lamb, that's the baby lamb, Now, my wife and I have an adopted son, so when I read this article about an orphan lamb, my heartstrings began to get pulled. I'm reading this story, and I'm like, what? Check this out. So there was an orphan ewe lamb, which means that mama lamb died, or excuse me, mama sheep died giving birth to the ewe lamb. In the same fold was a predicament that there was a mama sheep that lost her ewe lamb in birth. Therefore, you have the dilemma, just for clarification. You got baby, you lamb, no mama. You got mama with a deceased, you lamb. Do you understand the irony here? Now, you and I, putting two and two together, go, just connect the two. Logical. But in sheep ter- terminology, it does not work that simply. Therefore, the shepherd would do exactly what you and I would logically think would happen, and he tries to connect them, but it does not work. Then he got an idea, and this is what was so fascinating about the article. The shepherd takes the deceased ewe lamb, the baby lamb, shears the wool off the baby ewe lamb, and watch this, puts the wool on the orphan lamb that nobody takes in, fastens it to the ewe lamb, and now envision in your mind a big bundle of cotton balls with toothpicks sticking out from underneath it, bouncing around in the pasture. At that moment, all of a sudden, mama sheep begins to smell what? Her baby. But it's not her baby. It's the wool from her baby placed on the orphan. And in that moment when mama gets close, And takes the first inhale. From then on, she makes the connection that this is my baby. Watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 says this. You and I are the aroma of Christ to God. Now, Holy Spirit of God is about to break loose in my heart right now. I'm just telling you. You and I, the stench of death rampant through our sin. But when you and I give our life to Jesus Christ, the good shepherd becomes our shepherd. He robes us in righteousness, which means a holy God accepts us no longer as outcast or orphans. But the breath, that is when he breathes in the fragrance offering of Jesus Christ for you and for me, we are now sons and daughters of God 
forevermore. And that is because of a good shepherd. Come on. That's a word for us. So we see the contrast and the conviction. But point number three, write this down. We now see the call. Now I want you to look with me at John chapter 10, verse 27. It's an interesting statement. This actually is mentioned in John chapter 10, first few verses of the chapter. But notice in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. The word know literally translates intimacy and knowledge. It's not just being familiar. It's becoming family. For example, the good shepherd calls. And he calls us by name. His call also reveals his knowledge of our need and our nature. Now, my wife and I have four children. London, Lola, Liv, and Lawson. And we have nicknames for our kids. Now, moms and dads and grandparents in the room, how many of you would testify with a raised hand that you have actual nicknames for your kids or grandkids? Would you just raise your hand? Now, let me just share ours. My daughter named London, we call Lundy Lou. Lundy at times. Her sister Lola calls London Don Don. When you spell London, L-O-N-D-O-N, Lola calls her big sister Don Don. Well, guess whose name is Don? My grandfather, or excuse me, their grandfather, my father-in-law's name is Don. It's my wife's dad. So to honor him, little sister calls big sister Don Don. Lola is bearing the skin tone of my wife, who's Filipino. My wife Lola Olive skin, brown eyes, jet black hair. When she was born, our labor and delivery nurse, who happened to be Filipino, soon as Lola was born, said she looks like Shopau. Now, if you have no Filipino background, Shopau is a bread, it's a delicacy that's scrunched on the top. It looks like a Sharpe dog. Are you, are you with me on that mental picture? It's just scrunched together. My wife, being five foot tall and very petite, having a nine pound and a few ounce little girl named Lola, face scrunched together when the labor and delivery nurse called her Shopau from day one, we called Lola Shopau. We abbreviated that to Shopi which is not even a word. We just made that up. Shopey. <laughs> then it even got shorter. My daughter Lola is 12 years old in the sixth grade. Even this morning, I said, Sholo, can you pass me the syrup? Shopey, not even a word. Show, not even a word. We combined the words together, show and Lola to Sholo. That's what we got right now. <laughs> My daughter named Liv. It's not Olivia. Elizabeth, those are great names. We were just Aerosmith fans growing up. I don't, can I get a witness from anybody in the house? Amen. <laughs> Steve Tyler had a daughter named Liv, for those of you that don't know that. And so Liv, it's not short for anything, but Liv. My son Lawson, that we adopted from Africa, could not say Liv or her nickname from her friends, Livy. So he started calling her Chevy. Which means that my 11-year-old, that's right, I got a 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 11-year-old, and now 9-year-old. And Liv, who we call Chevy, her dream car is a Chevy Suburban because it's got her name on it. Amen. So <laughs> my son Lawson, my grandmother's last name was Lawson, very instrumental in me coming to know Jesus. To honor my grandmother, we gave him the name Lawson, but we also honored Lawson's actual birth grandmother, that would be Sweet Grandma Deshore was her last name. She named Lawson Teshemi or Teshoma, which means appointed leader in Amaric. Lawson means seeker of truth. Teshoma or Teshome means appointed leader. So when we reference Lawson at times, we will say El 
T. Therefore, all those nicknames are personal to our house. Take it a step further. My wife, being of Filipino descent, when she seeks to get the attention of our kids, will use a call. Some of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. You had a grandmother or a grandfather or even your mom and dad used a call to get your attention. So we could be in a crowd. Instead of my wife calling their name, she'll do this right here. So you got to listen. She would do this right here. She'd go, shh. <laughs> and my kids, they immediately start looking for mama. Last night, we were at what's called the Miracle League which is a phenomenal sports ministry in our city for handicapped children. Over 160 handicapped children get to play Little League Baseball, and, the, and it's free, and it's full, they're fully uniformed. And one of our church members named Mike Miller, God used him to start that in our city, prolific ministry. And we're at this fundraising event last night. Ronnie Millsaps, a great country singer, was singing last night. And my wife and I were just dancing in the corner. And we got split up for just a moment. She ended up talking to some friends, and the music was loud. And I began to look at my watch, and it was time to go. And I said, Stephanie, nothing. Steph, nothing. Brown sugar, nothing. All of a sudden, I went, shh. She started looking. It's family. Do you understand what I'm trying to lay down right now? I'm hoping you pick up some stuff I'm laying down to you. And what I'm trying to teach you is this. We have a good shepherd that knows your name. He knows you so well. He knows your idiosyncrasies. He knows your dysfunctionalities. He knows your quirks. Everything about you that makes you you. And guess what? Not only does he love you, he actually likes you too. We've said that many times. And he desires to be intimately involved in the details of your life. That's what makes him the good shepherd. But check this out. Not only does he know your name, he knows your need. Your need. Now watch this. When it comes to shepherding in Great Britain, there is a tradition where they take the sheep that is by the flock and the fold, and the shepherd baptizes them in what's called antiseptic. It looks so cruel. They're holding them down in this bucket or trough, and it seems as if they're drowning them, but you know what they're doing? They're baptizing them in antiseptic to kill all diseases and parasites to keep them healthy. Do you now find it interesting in Psalm 23, verse 5, the Lord says, I anoint your head with what? Oil. What was the oil? Medicinal. Some of you got broken hearts. Let the oil of the shepherd soothe and heal your hearts today. Many of you find yourself, you have been worn, torn, and tattered by the elements of this world, and you find yourself overwhelmed by the challenges. It's the oil of the Lord that gives anointing and healing in your life. That's why we anoint with oil on communion weekends, because we believe that by His stripes we can be healed in Jesus' name, and therefore it's the oil of the Lord that allows us to find revival and refreshing, and therefore the Bible teaches He not only knows our name, He knows our need, but He also knows our nature. Do you know that sheep have no directional component, no defense mechanism? In Turkey in 2005, check this out, 450 sheep died. Actually, a little over 1,100 sheep jumped off a cliff in 2005. You know why? Because the shepherd was not watching and one sheep jumped off and the rest followed, 450 died. The others did not die because they landed on top of the other sheep. Crazy as that sounds. But one led them astray. Why? Because the sheep were now not under the watch care of the shepherd. Isn't it interesting in Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, it comforts me. That is, the rod would be the defense mechanism for the shepherd to beat off the predator. But the hook would be the element. Watch this. And I want you to draw your attention here. As the sheep would go into the sheep pen, guess what he would do with the shepherd's hook? He would lift up their neck and, in, and inspect for disease or parasites to provide healing through the oil salve. 
Not only that, but he ultimately would use the shepherd hook when we would wander as sheep. We see this in Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Aren't you grateful that you got a shepherd that doesn't use this end on you, but uses this end on you and just brings you back in to the fold? He protects you with this end, but uses this end to bring you back in. He knows your nature. What is our nature? Our nature, I don't know about you, but our nature has a tendency to wander. Because we think somewhere else we can find satisfaction Nobody will satisfy you like the good shepherd. And here's what I'm saying to you. If you're not careful, you'll start listening to a lot of voices that may sound like the shepherd, but it's not. You start living for the affection and for the applause of somebody else, and it seems so, so soothing to your soul, but it leaves you empty. But you got a good shepherd that calls you. Not only does he call you, but he also comforts you. Notice this in verse 28. He comforts you. Now, as I write this on the door today, the Bible teaches in John chapter 10, verse 28, we see this statement. You could actually see this printed in your notes. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. There we go. It came back on. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now there's two words that are very important in that verse, give and snatch. The word give means to grant. The Bible teaches, for example, y'all still listen and say amen. Come on. First John chapter 5 verse 12 says this, whoever has the son has life. You don't have the son, you don't have life. First John 5:13, I write these things that you may know you have eternal life, which means eternal life is not a mystery. You can know that you know that you know you got eternal life. What's John 17 verse 3 teach? This is eternal life, knowing God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And because Jesus is our good shepherd, he gives us, which means he grants, he bestows possession. You and I have the possession of eternal life because Jesus is our good shepherd. But also Jesus, the good shepherd, gives us eternal life, which means that no one can snatch it from us. Us. It's ours through Jesus because we're not orphans, we're not outcasts, we're sons and daughters of the living God. And therefore the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he has no ability to snatch you out of the hands of the Father. And you're in the grip and the grasp of a good, good shepherd that will never let you go. And I want to show you something today that illustrates that, that I did with a group of third graders this week. And I had the time of my life speaking at an elementary school this week. They allowed me to do just a simple object illustration, teaching Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Do you know this about the good shepherd in Luke 15? He's got 100 sheep, but one gets away. You and I would think, well, got 99, I'm good. But he leaves the 99, and he does what? He goes after the one. And this was the object illustration that I did. Now, I need you to pay attention. In this Ziploc bag, bag is an assortment of items. And as I dump this on to my table today, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. Everything that's in this bag I use with a group of third graders this week. And I thought if it worked so well with a group of third graders, it would work really well with an entire church of adults in this room today. There in that bag, I put onto the table a rainbow loom. Some of our kids in the room know exactly what this is. You take a bunch of rubber bands and you can crochet that into a keychain or Whatever you desire. I have a paper clip. I also have a penny. I have a USB jump drive, chapstick, a pencil, an earring. In our house with three daughters, we got a lot of random solo earrings floating around. And then the cap to the greatest drink in America, and that would be Dr. Pepper. Amen. <laughs> but now I draw your attention to this ticket. And this ticket is a ticket to this past week's San Antonio Spurs versus the Memphis Grizzlies, where we won, of course, in overtime, prophetically and predicting the next wave of this series that will take place in the next few days between the Spurs and the Grizzlies, therefore causing them, that is the Grizzlies, to be defeated by our amazing Spurs. Can I get an amen, a witness from somebody? Amen. Now, 
this ticket's got value. Now, here's what I did with those elementary school kids. I went through all that I've already done with you, and then I asked everybody to take a photographic look at everything together. And then on the count of three, I asked them to open their eyes and tell me what was missing. So that means right now, I need everybody in the house today to close your eyes. You've already taken a photographic look at everything on this podium. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you would open your eyes and you tell me what's missing. One, two, three. What's missing? The ticket. Now, watch this. The reason why you knew that the ticket was missing, and this is interesting, you had already predetermined based upon the description of everything that I revealed to you on that counter, that table, that podium, you already predetermined that this ticket, San Antonio Spurs ticket, was more valuable than everything else. You predetermined that. You knew possibly that this ticket, let's just say section 118, row 16, seat A, let's just say that's a $50 ticket. That's a whole lot more than a bottle cap, a paper clip, one earring, USB drive, all those things that I mentioned. So automatically, based upon you determining what was more valuable, in your mind knew that the first thing I'm going to look for when I'm told to open my eyes is the biggest item and also the most valuable item. I hope you understand what I'm trying to tell you today. That when the Bible teaches that one left from the fold and the shepherd went after the one, Why did Jesus go after the one and not just go, I got 99, I'm good? Because every single one of his sheep are valuable just like the way that you were looking for the most valuable item on that podium. Which means if you are part of the fold of God, sons and daughters of God, he knows your name, he knows your need, he knows your nature. And if you find yourself wandering, he loves you enough to chase you down. Why? Because you matter. You have worth. You have value. Maybe somebody's never told you that before, but you need to know you got worth and you got value, and the shepherd knows everything about you, and there's nothing in the heart of our good shepherd that pushes you away to say he's ever disappointed or disgusted. Why? Because you have worth and value. And what determines that? Not just somebody saying, I love you, but somebody being willing to die for you. Die for you. Now, last weekend, do you remember that moment where all of a sudden I connected some dots for you based upon this message from last week that Jesus is the door. Therefore, the door is a person. The door is a proposal. The door is a promise. The door is a privilege. The door is provision. For those of you that were not here with us last weekend, it was between the 10 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service that God told me by the power of the Holy Spirit to change point number four. My question was, Holy Spirit, why do you want me to change point number four? And when I wrote it down, this ADD preacher, that would be me, began to see something in this that basically would begin to decode itself as I was talking about the door. In A-I-L-S. And then I now begin to realize that the very reason why that was unfolding, even for this week's message, when you go back to your listener guide, you'll see some blanks that I did not fill in, but let me fill them in for you. In point number one, you'll see in the verse, I am the good shepherd. The letter D goes in that blank. When you go to point number two, the conviction of the shepherd. In verse 11, he lays down his life for the sheep. The letter O goes in that blank. Point number three, the call of the shepherd. It's in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. It's the letter O in that blank. Then you go to point number four, the comfort of the shepherd. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. It's the letter R in that blank, spelling for us the word door, which reminds us when Jesus would lay between the two walls saying that he is the door. Now we understand he's the good shepherd, knows our name, knows our need, knows our our nature. He calls us. He comforts us. His conviction caused him to lay down his life for us. But now we know without a shadow of a doubt that it's the cross of Calvary by the nails 
serving as the door that anybody that would say to Jesus, I give you my life, our sin is paid for. It is fully covered by the blood of Jesus, who is our good shepherd. Amen. And watch how this all comes together. Jesus, our good shepherd, loved us enough to die for us, come back from the dead for us. But watch in verse 6 of Psalm 23. You know this. Just listen to it. Surely goodness and mercy will what? Follow me all the days of my life. I had a Holy Spirit breakout moment in my study this week. And I want you to listen to me. For 25 to 30 minutes, I've been telling you that the shepherd leads, which he does. But why does verse 6 say his, his grace, his mercy, his favor, it follows us. It follows. You know why? Look at the application of point number four. He seals us versus releases. There's no back door to the love of God. That is, he's got us in the front. He's got us in the back, and he's got us cinched in and secure in between, which means you can't get out. You're stuck in this relationship, and just like Pastor Jason Cook said, that love is sticky. And as we understand that love, that love is never going to let you go. And we invite you into this love relationship with Jesus, not into religion, but into a relationship with him. So with heads bowed, eyes closed for a brief moment, we're going to take communion together after this invitation and I want us today to consider the opportunity to give our life to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that before, today we extend that opportunity to you. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you've never done that before, today we invite you to boldly walk through that door. Receive salvation, forgiveness once and for all. If that's your desire today... Would you just say this to him and mean it from the depth of your heart? Just say this to him. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe you died for me. And right now, I'm asking you to save me, change me, forgive me. Now, with heads bowed, eyes closed, I wonder today, all across this worship center, if there would anybody in the house go, past your head, it finally made sense for me. It finally clicked for me. It finally connected for me. I've received Jesus as my Savior. Never done that before, but today I did. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you're seated? How many of you would just be honest and go, that's the decision I made today? Hold up your hand as tall as you can. Anybody in the room today that would just be honest? Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else today that would just be honest? Thank you, sir. For those of you that raised your hand, I want you to look at me. It's the greatest decision of your life. Much like our visitors for the first time, if you'll take that tarot portion, write your name, check a box, I'm a guest. We'll give you a free gift at our guest relations counter. And for those of you that accepted Jesus, do the same thing, but then check the box, I accepted Jesus. And you could go to our guest relations counter and get a free Bible. If you don't want to do those things, you could drop it in the offering box. And somebody's going to contact you this week to tell you how proud we are of you. But right here at the 1 o'clock crowd, you can tell there's a lot of energy in the house. And we cannot wait to tell you how thankful we are for you and how proud we are of you. So right now, 1 o'clock service, come on, let's put our hands together to celebrate the decisions of those that have been made. Welcome to the family of God.